Trump is coming to the Libertarian Convention. Yeah. So let me just ask at the outset, you're, you're involved in libertarian politics, like actual politi party politics. Um, would you ever be on the ticket? You know, so uh, just for people who don't know, it's kind of like inside baseball. But so my there was kind of no, a, a civil war. <laughs> <laughs> it's more inside baseball is too broad. It's more like inside yeah. pickleball. <laughs> yes, yes. That, that is actually a really good uh, thing. But in this very irrelevant corner where I have a lot of uh, sway. Um, <laughs> but th so there was basically like a, a kind of civil war within the Libertarian Party over the last few years. And it was about a lot of the stuff that you were talking about at the beginning. Like uh, basically there was like, you know, as you know, because you covered it, there was what was called the Ron Paul revolution. Yes. And that's what I was. I was one of the young people in yes. That Ron Paul revolution that totally changed, you know, the way I look at the world. And I became obsessed with all of this stuff. And so there were a bunch of us and a lot of us had hoped that um, Rand Paul was kind of going to yes. carry the mantle and continue this this Ron Paul energy. And now I'm not saying anything against Rand Paul. I think he's one of the best senator, probably the best senator. He was great during COVID and grilling Fauci and all of that stuff. But for whatever reason, there's there's several. It didn't work out that way and yes. Donald Trump came in and stole the Republican Party and it stole I mean he won it but anyway so when that happened um, there were a lot of us who were like kind of disappointed about Rand Paul and then the we had Ron Paul running in the Republican Party but then a lot of us started looking to the Libertarian Party like oh they were the third party candidate and they ran Gary Johnson and Bill Weld we were very disappointed with that campaign uh, particularly with Bill Weld who's just horrible um sad and, defeated guy and and also just told, he was like a raytheon lobbyist who was like what are you doing over total here? fraud what's the point yeah, if we're I gonna know. have a third party and putting that guy up and then during uh 2020 the people who were running the libertarian party f completely failed and didn't oppose the lockdowns and and then started like virtue signaling during the black lives matter riots about how we must be anti-racist for it, real yeah it was horrible so basically, then there was this uh, group called the Mises Caucus uh, that I joined. Uh, I was led by this guy named Michael Heiss and uh, Angela McCardle, who ultimately is she's currently the chair of the party. And we basically went and took over the whole party We Good. For, for in the name of Ron Paulians. Like if there's going to be a, a libertarian <laughs> party, it's going to be represented by libertarians. And so anyway, cutting to. So once that happened, it was kind of my group who took over and they they wanted me to run for for president on the libertarian ticket and i was considering it for a while ultimately it just wasn't the right time for me i got two little kids i got a lot yeah. going on in my career it's like it just wasn't the right time for me but so now to what you said angela mccardle pu pulled this off to her great credit that she's got donald trump coming and speaking at the libertarian uh, national convention uh it lo looks like rfk jr when is also and coming. where is this this is at the end of the month it's a uh, may May 24th through 26th, I believe. In Washington? In Washington, D.C. That was a decision made by the old guard. We would not have had our convention in Washington, D.C. Do you know where it is in D.C.? Yeah, it's at um, like a, at some hotel. I, I, I'd have to look it up. Yeah, but yeah it's at some hotel in, in D.C. Um, but anyway, I mean, RFK just challenged Donald Trump to debate him there, which I don't think is going to happen, <laughs> but would be very interesting if, yeah. it, if it did happen. And so it is, at, at least to me, it kind of represents... The Libertarian Party, who is, is this third party, trying to engage in relevance of, of some sort and trying to at least look, obviously, we're not in a position we're not going to win the White House or even win any Senate seats or anything like that. But I do think the Libertarian Party could effectively be used to put pressure, uh, particularly on the Republicans yes. to be better and to not run like awful neocons and run better candidates. Um, I certainly prefer the kind of America first strain of Republicans to the neoconservative strain. And and I think right now there is, well, I mean, there's kind of been a civil war in the right half of America since Donald Trump came onto the scene. But I don't even know if you'd call it a civil war because Donald Trump just won so dominantly. You know, it's not like the Republicans were split between Jeb Bush and Donald Trump or something. It was right. like, no, like it was 95 to 5%. But particularly, and I know you've talked about this a lot since the the war in Israel, or I should say the war in Gaza, or I don't even know if I should say the war, the the attack of Gaza, whatever you call it. Yes. I don't know if you can call it a war when one side doesn't have a military, but whatever you call that. Um, since that, you've seen this kind of divide grow uh, where I think largely neoconservatism had been rejected in, by, the, by the voters, yes. by the Re Republican voters. But when Israel came up, it's a little bit different 
Uh, I, I don't know exactly. Well, neoconservatism, neoconservatism is like chicken pox. Like you think you defeat it. <laughs> yeah. And then when your defenses are down, it comes back as shingles. You're like, oh, crap. They're Democrats now? <laughs> Jesus. <laughs> no, I didn't see. True. How's that coming? It, it just they... lays dormant. It's yeah. always there. Yeah. And, but when it comes back in its second iteration, when it manifests again, it is disabling. And that's what we're watching. Like I, if there's one thing I wanted to help do is get rid of that yeah. worldview, but it seems stronger than ever. Well, I think you have done a lot. I mean, I, I really Not do. Not really. I mean, <laughs> if you can, I, it's like everybody in the Republican Party is completely on board with the idea that wars, non-essential wars make America better or something. I, that's so nuts. It's what's, what's so wild to me about it is just after the 20 years of terror wars that have just been such a complete disaster that America would still be entering these conflicts that are very clearly wars of choice. Like yes. there's no, I mean, I, I'm, I know they can make an argument like they were making the argument that Putin, if he takes Ukraine, is going to take Poland and then is going to take, which is nothing he's ever said. He, there's not one thing Putin's ever said that you could point to. In fact, when you interviewed him, he it's explicitly absurd, yeah. said, if Poland attacks us, that's the only scenario he's I could see He's got the going largest more. country in the world. Yeah, it's like, the biggest landmass on planet Earth. It's incredibly complex to run. It's 20% Muslim. They have all these yeah. sort of semi-autonomous zones throughout the country. He wants more land? I don't think he wants yeah. more land. No, look, he's always it's like said, insane. Uh, it's been very, and it's not just that he's said it, but like uh, almost everyone who was being honest has said it uh, at the top levels of the American government, as well as at NATO as well. His issue was Ukrainian entry into NATO. Yes, that was always his issue. And we kept pushing that and kept pushing that. And that's what got him to react. And even the head of NATO himself, Strosenberg, whatever, said yes. that, Vladimir Putin said that if you just signed a, a deal, put it in writing, that Ukraine won't join NATO, I won't invade. And NATO refused. And so he invaded. But is there a single news story even now that doesn't describe reflexively, describe almost like it's like a block text in, you know, in the in the computer program, the unprovoked invasion of Ukraine? Right. They always have to say that. Unprovoked. There's never been a more provoked invasion. Well, I mean, yeah. They did it on purpose. They pushed Russia to invade Ukraine. Well, obviously. let's just say, I mean, like, Let's say we had um, like a, a fairly pro-American government in Mexico that um, and Russia wanted to get them to do an economic deal with them. And then we were trying to convince them not to do that economic deal, but to do an economic deal with us. And ultimately, we convinced them that they're going to be in an economic partnership with us. And so then Russia came in and overthrew the democratically elected government and installed a pro-Russian <laughs> government. And then that led to a civil war where 15,000 people died and like the pro-American side was getting, you know what I mean? Like, would you go, we, it was so unprovoked. <laughs> like, yeah. I and, mean, then, and then, and then. Russia said, we're going to get Mexico to join our defense alliance and we're yes. going to put missiles, missiles in, in Tijuana. Right, right. Oh, and no, by the way, that had been floated out for years. <laughs> and in fact, in 2008, we had formally announced that that Russia had formally announced that Mexico would be joining their military alliance. Then we went. I'm sorry for people out there. You're right. It was a totally organic uprising made on revolution. It's, uh, Victoria Newland happened to be in the middle of it, handing out <laughs> sandwiches that don't let that, you know, like John McCain and they, oh, they were going there a lot. And like, yeah, sure. It was Soros backed NGOs that were funding that, but, but whatever. That's a, it was a totally organic movement, you know, um, and so. Yeah, no, it was a, a series of provocations, very unnecessary ones, and not just like not just ones that like libertarian doves like me or something like that were against, but that what George Kennan, uh, the Cold Warrior, of right, the, the founder of the containment strategy, what he said, which is a great piece with him and Thomas Friedman in the New York Times, and I think it was in 1999. And he laid it out right there when we first started the first round of NATO expansion. And he said the people advocating this expansion are going to keep advocating it until there's a Russian uh, response. And then when there's that response, they'll say, see, this is why we were right to, to expand NATO. But Obama, that's all wrong. Obama even made noises that suggested he understood what you just mm -hmm. said. 